that way with the other. There we are, the recording has started. Right. Um, so this is supposed to be a talk on mathematical puzzles. It's a bit of an experiment. It's um, I put first INA virtual branch talk. I think Stephen was referring to it earlier as the inaugural. Um, uh, we hope this will work. Anyway, uh, my name is Peter Rollett. Uh, assisting me is uh, moderator Stephen Lee. Uh, Stephen works for MEI, Maths and Education Industry, and uh, this is MEI's Illuminate room that we're using. Uh, so it's very kind of them. Um, Stephen and I are involved with the Early Career Mathematicians Group and the East Midlands branch of the Institute of Mathematics and its applications. Uh, so. I'll I'll tell you a little about those things first of all. Uh, the IMA, if the, for those of you who don't know it, the IMA has a um, branch network. And Stephen and I are both on the committee of the East Midlands branch. Branches exist in various areas of the country, uh, although not everywhere. Currently, the IMA website lists East Midlands, West Midlands, West of England, Northwest, London, Scottish, and Irish branches. Um, Although this varies from time to time, uh, branches are run by members, for members. They usually do talks. They sometimes do school stuff, uh, activities. They sometimes do uh, social excursions, things like that. Uh, if there isn't a branch in your area, you can set one up. Uh, anyway, so there's a web address there. But if you go to the INA website and then click on activities, you can find branches fairly easily. Uh, the other thing that Stephen and I are involved with is the Early Career Mathematicians Group. Um, we're also on the committee for that. We seem to be a bit of a sucker for committees, Stephen and I. Uh, possibly we just don't know how to say no to people. But, uh, anyway, <laughs> so uh, for students and mathematicians within fi 15 years of graduating from a university maths career, is the point of the early career group. Um, now, as well as early career mathematicians input into general IMA activities. Um, we have we have ECM members on, on various other IMA committees. The main activity of the group is two conferences a year. Uh, the previous conference was uh, last Saturday in Loughborough. Uh, the next one's in Bristol on Saturday the 19th of November 2011. Uh, so again, there's a link, but again, if you go IMA website and just click on activities, you'll find you'll find your way there. Right, this talk is being given through Illuminate, uh, which I noticed as I logged in is perhaps now changed its name to Blackboard Collaborate. Uh, it's good once you've got the hang of what something is called for it to change its name, isn't it? Um, you can chat, as some of you have been doing, in this chat box down here. Uh, so if you look at the, at the side of your screen, you should see this chat box. Uh, you can type into that. Uh, the other thing that I want you to pay attention to is uh, the voting part of the screen. Uh, which is just down here, I'll highlight it in yellow. Now, as a test, to see that you've all got this working, uh, I'd like you to answer the question, which of the following constants do you most prefer? Um, just answer anything. Uh, I, I, it doesn't really matter. I mean, we will use these answers to classify you, and if you get it wrong, we will someone, send someone around to your house, of course. But. So everyone's answered but Lloyd. Is that, Lloyd, are you having a problem? Okay, Lloyd, you said A into the chat. If you look above the chat, there's this. That's it. So everyone's done that except Stephen and I, so that's good. Uh, you're all working. Uh, we'll use that at some point during the talk, anyway. Um, right, some types of puzzle. I, it's One thing that's occurred to me quite recently is that there are really different types of puzzle. We were trying to get together a stall, which I'm going to talk about later on, for a local science fair. And um, one of the people involved in this was was really trying to um, propose puzzles. He was proposing puzzles that were sort of audience interaction puzzles, so the kind of probabilistic things where you need a group of at least 30 people to get them to work or something like that. Um, and that wasn't necessarily going to work for a stall where you might get people coming along in twos and threes. So you couldn't do any of these these large scale, you know, everyone toss a coin and something something type puzzles. Uh, and then another, another sort again is that sort of small group and individual puzzles. And I, I've done something with this with a, a sheet of puzzles last week. Uh, and actually, a lot of them didn't weren't necessarily very useful for a talk, for example, because they're 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 a different sort of puzzle. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the first two of these, uh, and hopefully get a little bit of audience interaction as we go along. Uh, so small group puzzles. My experience here um, is with a, a thing called Mass Jam. Um, Mass Jam is a monthly puzzles in the pub night. It was started in London by a chap called Matt Parker, and it's now spread to Manchester, Nottingham, Glasgow, Edinburgh, Dublin, and Reading. 
Uh, there was one in Perth in June, although that doesn't seem to have been repeated uh, in July. Anyway, and it's proposed in several more cities. So if you go to the web address, you can find your nearest one, and um, and you can find where else has been proposed. And if you if you live there, you can say, oh, I'd come along if you if you set one up here. Uh, but they're just organised by local people. I organised the Nottingham one, um, for example. Uh, these are some photos from the Nottingham Maths Jam at the Boston. Uh, it says on the website, Maths Jam is an opportunity for like-minded, self-confessed maths enthusiasts to get together and share stuff they like. Puzzles, games, problems, or just anything they think is cool or interesting. Uh, it's my observation that different groups have slightly different um, behaviours, I think, but I'll tell you about the Nottingham one, because that's the one I know. We often get around six people, let's say. Um, somebody runs it, which is often me or sometimes another member, uh, that person will bring a set of puzzles. I try and take more puzzles than I think I'll need. Uh, and everyone else is invited to bring things along as well. And then really we just play with things and see where it takes us. So um, so I might have found a puzzle in a book and I show it to people and then somebody says, oh, that reminds me of what I know. And then they go through their, their puzzle that they know. And, and we, There are a lot of word puzzles of the Dudley Lloyd type, if you know these, these authors. Uh, and also games, little short games that people can play. So uh, what makes an individual small group puzzle? What makes a good one? Um, I think puzzles that are good for this sort of thing are ones that are simple to state, slightly intriguing, ones that require you to process some information and perhaps draw a diagram and things like that, but take some time to think about what you're being asked. So I suppose what I'm saying is that this sort of puzzle is, is good when it's the sort of puzzle that gets you into the polyer mason type problem solving approach. And uh, puzzles that are counterintuitive or that involve misdirection are, uh, are nice as well. <laughs> so here's an example of a, a word puzzle. I'm going to leave this up for a minute or so so that you can, um, you can have a go and answer it. Uh, so there's a wooden cube, n units on a side, so an n by n by n wooden cube. It's painted red on the outside and then cut into n cubed unit cubes. So exactly one fourth of the total number of faces of the unit cubes are red. The question is, what is n? I'll leave that with you for a moment. Oh, you can answer in the chat window. I didn't say that. That's about a minute. So I, don't, I don't see any answers. I don't know if that means you're all stuck or uh, if you're all calculating away. Or if you can no longer hear me. <laughs> calculating and thinking, it says in the uh, <laughs> right, I think I should move on, but if anyone has an answer, uh, perhaps in the next 10 seconds, otherwise I might spoil it for you. Uh, a Terry Pratchett joke seems like a good opportunity to uh, to stuff it. Ben, uh, no, I'm afraid not. Right. What you've got here, you've got n3 unit, n, n cubed unit cubes, okay, each of which have six faces. Originally, when the cube was put was together, every face was painted. And if you think about it, each of the faces of the large cube is an n by n by n cube. So each face has n by n of the unit cubes sticking out on it. Um, so that's n squared. 
squared and there are six faces for the large cube so that's 6n squared so 6n squared faces were coloured and there are 6n cubed in all so we want that ratio and we're told that that is equal to a quarter uh, so I hope it's not too much of a, of a stretch to realise therefore that uh, n is equal to 4 now I quite like that puzzle probably because when we did it at Maths Jam we got ourselves into a right muddle with it <laughs> so although I'm very confident with the answer now uh, at the time we, we, we went down all sorts of dead ends before we got there so uh, and I think that, that often makes you remember a, a puzzle quite fondly uh, if it's one that's tripped you up in the past right here's another example I need to draw some people <laughs> ben says he missed an N. Right, so I'm drawing these people. These people are buried in the sand. Um, and what that means is basically that they can't turn around. So they can't look at the person behind him. And uh, in between here is a wall. Um, so the three people on the right can't see the one person on the left because there's a wall in the way. Now these people are told that there are two black hats and two white hats put on them. Um, they aren't told the order, but this is the order. Okay. Now, if any of them identifies their own hat, they all go free. But if they guess, if any of them guess incorrectly, they all die. Now, one of them can answer correctly. And the question is which. I'm going to label these, and I hope Stephen's going to clear the vote from before so that you can you can vote again. So A, B, C, and D. Who is the person who is able to answer this question correctly? Apart from Sharon, who already knows the answer. <laughs> Then that's right, they can't turn around and look behind them. Uh, the noses are to indicate which way they're looking when they were buried. Stephen's suggesting I, I restate the problem. So these four people are buried uh, in sand. They cannot turn around. There is a wall between separating A from B, C, and D. Uh, so they can only see in front of them the way their nose is facing. Uh, they can't communicate, Jimmy, that's right. Uh, they're told that two hats are black and two hats are white. And if any of them identifies their own hat, they all go free. And if any of them get, uh, if any of them guess incorrectly, then they all die. Uh, there isn't a mirror on the wall, then. <laughs> no sort of trickery like that. Uh, one of them can answer this correctly. So the question is, which one? At the moment, we have one answer. I think I'll give you a few more seconds. I must have explained it better than it the second time because more of you now are answering C. Uh, I'll tell you now, C is the correct answer. Okay, so A um, over here can't see anybody else, so he has no information about anybody else. C can think to himself, well, if D could see that these two, B and C, were wearing the same colour, then D would know that he was wearing the opposite colour and would shout out what that colour was. So since D hasn't shouted out, C can therefore deduce that he must be wearing a different colour to the person in front of him. And therefore he can shout it out. So I hope that's clear. Anyway. <laughs> The other thing we, we do a bit of at Math Jam is uh, games. Uh, Two-player games are good, um, and simple short games are good. 
uh, because you sort of you don't want to be spending hours or half hours or something like this on, on a game if you're in a sort of small group puzzling environment, I would say. Uh, either puzzles that are a bought kit that somebody brings along or that are easy to construct. There's no good having uh, very complicated stuff going on. Uh, here's an example. I'm not going to spend this spend too long on this, but you could write it down to play with someone next time you, you have the opportunity. Uh, but this game is quite good and a sort of typical sort of thing. Um, if you place ten playing cards in a row, the first player turns over a single card, any card they like, and then each player turns either a single card or a pair of adjoining cards. And the player who turns over the last card wins. Uh, so that's that game. Uh, so you can you can perhaps play this with someone, and you'll you'll see that you sort of you sort of play it, and you end up with a solution or whatever. You, but uh, so th there are questions that you can ask about this. So so you know what is the best strategy? Uh, is there a way for one player or the other to always win or force a draw? Uh, and you can try it with different numbers of cards. I think remember we tried it with all sorts of different numbers of cards this game when we when we played it at past year. Uh, but there are quite a few games like this. It's a bit um, NIM-like, I think, isn't it? Where you, you sort of take away things and the person to take the last one or the person to force the other person to take the last one loses or wins, depending on the, uh, depending on the game. Uh, so that sort of thing can be quite fun and interesting. Right, so a little reminder that Mass Jam is in these cities. Uh, it's always the second to last Tuesday of the month everywhere. Um, and uh, there is proposed in several more cities to so check the website and shout if you are interested in that sort of thing. Uh, if there isn't one near you, you can set one up. It's not too difficult, really. Uh, there's also an annual Mass Jam conference, which happened for the first time last year, uh, and they're going to repeat. This is on the weekend of the 12th and 13th of November 2011, and it is somewhere, I want to say somewhere near Crewe, I think. Um, but anyway, you can get the details from massjam.com. Uh, the weekend was a lot of fun. It was um, um, lots of short five-minute talks of people showing puzzles and things that they found interesting. Uh, so it had the same sort of ethos, but it was a very nice moment. Sharon St. Key, I, I'm not sure. You can go to mathsjam.com and look that up. Uh, I'm not sure. Right, I'll talk a little bit about stalls. Uh, we, um, I was approached this year to take a math puzzle stall to the East Midlands Big Bang. Um, fair or festival. I don't know if you know the Big Bang, but there's a there's a big national Big Bang STEM event, um, and uh, then there are regional ones as well. And the Nottingham one, uh, sorry, the East Midlands one was in Nottingham, uh, and they asked me if I'd bring a, a puzzle stall. Ben's very Ben and Stephen are both lit up. It is near Crew um, Mass Jam this year, so that's helpful. Thank you. <laughs> um, so this was last month, actually, this stall. Um, and I asked a group of people from the Nottingham Maths Jam to help out. There's a web address here, which is the website where I put each of the um, handouts and bits and pieces that we used on the stall. Uh, I put online at this address. I actually have a slide at the end with all the web addresses on, so if you haven't quite caught them, that's not a problem. Here's a picture I took um, during the fair. Uh, I'll talk about a couple of things here. One is um, this chap on the right here. Uh, this is John, who helped me uh, helps me at Mass Jam and, and uh, help put this thing together. He's holding a chessboard. He was doing a couple of things here. He has a, uh, a jar full of rice, and he's asking people to guess how much rice there is in the jar. Now, I don't know if you know this, this, this game. Um, there's a story um, about a fair, and it's a, a, a sort of village fate thing where they have a guess the weight of the ox competition. And um, uh, basically, uh, a statistician looked at the list of guesses, and none of them were correct, but when he averaged them, the average was almost spot on. And this is where the whole wisdom of crowds thing comes from. Anyway, so John had a, had a little pot with a thousand grains of rice in, and then he had a jar with twenty thousand grains of rice in, uh, and the game was to guess how many how many were in the jar. Uh, he told you there were a thousand, and so you had to sort of recognise that there were about twenty times as many in the jar. Um, now we took the guesses. He got quite a lot of guesses, and uh, so we averaged them, and you expect the average to come out more or less what the correct answer is. 
uh, his average came out, I think, nine times larger than the correct answer. <laughs> so I don't know quite what that tells us. It certainly, I, I, I expect it tells us that rice is quite hard to, uh, to estimate visually. Uh, John also felt that some kids, if it was over a thousand, they would just get a million automatically, and that brought the average rice up. <laughs> so that's problematic. Um, another thing that's happening in this picture is these two in the bottom left, who are, uh, which type of average? Mean. Arithmetic mean, I think. Uh, uh, these two in the corner are playing with Rubik's cubes. Uh, so that gets me on to something that I'm going to talk about just briefly. Um, Physical puzzles are quite good, for, particularly for a stall environment. Uh, I tend to take something like this along to Mouse Jam as well, because there's often somebody who will happily sit in the corner and play with a Rubik's Cube. Um, but particularly in a stall, you want people who are wandering by to get drawn in by something. And uh, just picking up a wooden puzzle, you know, fit the blocks into the other block type puzzle, or, or, a, or a Rubik's Cube, or something like that, uh, can be quite a useful sort of device. And uh, this is Sharon's cube, as she was pointing out earlier, uh, that she brought to Maths Jam last time. And Sharon's dice. <laughs> right. Uh, this image, I took this image as we were setting up. There are three things I'm going to point out here in succession. Over in the corner here are some bamboo canes. Now, these are, uh, we were given a brief for this store. We were given um, a small table and quite a lot of floor space. So we, we scaled up a few puzzles. You can see the large playing cards there. These bamboo canes are acting as matchsticks. Uh, matchstick puzzles are quite a good example of, of physical puzzles. Um, so here's a, a sort of typical one. Um, the game here is to move three matches to make two squares. Now, I don't know if you just want to write this one down. I'm going to leave it with you. I'm not going to give you the solution. Uh, it's also going to be very difficult to ask you to give me your solution um, because that would involve drawing a picture or reaching into my computer and moving matches around somehow. So uh, I won't ask you to do that. But, uh, anyway, uh, you can find plenty of these sorts of things online. There are a lot like this where you're given a layout and you're asked to move a certain number of matches to do something um, to produce some result. Uh, and they're, they're quite interesting little puzzles. The second thing here I would point out is in the middle. Now that is a, uh, if you can see there, what I'm highlighting is a hula hoop uh, with some masking tape on it uh, and some little tokens. So I'll explain what that's all about. Uh, there's this puzzle. Um, I'm going to change to a pen. I'm going to draw lines across this circle. One there. One there. I'm just going to change the colour. Draw one there. Now then, for this, you're given some tokens. So you're given sets of tokens: one, and then two, and then three, and then four, five, six, and seven. Now the game is to arrange these tokens into these seven areas. If you see the way I've divided up the circle, there are seven areas. One of these areas must hold one token, one of them must hold two, one of them must hold three, and so on. And the game is to, uh, is to arrange them in that way so that there are an equal number of tokens. First of all, either side of the red line, um, which is not too difficult a problem. Um, I just wonder if you if you sort of understand, but if I move the one token, say, there, and then the two tokens, well, I might put those in the middle here, and then pick up the three, put them in this one here, and so on, until you've got, uh, you've maintained the ordering, if you like. Uh, so to put, so that there's an equal number of tokens either side of the red line, and then a more advanced version of the puzzle is so that there are an equal number of tokens either side of all three lines simultaneously. And that latter problem I know three solutions for. So, uh, again, want to have a bit of fun with at some point if, you're, uh, if you've got a piece of paper and uh, fancy a bit of doodling. Uh, you don't have to use a hula hoop <laughs> in order to do this puzzle. Right. And lastly, I'll point out these playing cards on the floor. You'll notice there's a four by four grid of playing cards there. And on the next slide, um, here's uh, a lad playing with another four by four grid, although this one we'll find out in a minute is of a different type. 
Uh, and just while I'm showing you this image, you'll notice here's a wooden puzzle in the foreground. And here's a, a Sudoku Rubik's Cube <laughs> in the top of that. Right, let me tell you about magic squares. Magic squares are um, a square, you have to arrange them. Let me draw a magic square out. If I put four, nine, two, three, five, seven, eight, one, six. Uh, you may or may not notice that every row, column, and diagonal in this square adds up to the same number, uh, in this case 15. But that, that's what a magic square is. Every row, column, and diagonal sums to the magic constant, which in this case is 15. Uh, these go back at least 4,000 years, I think. So I've read uh, magic squares. So they're, they're interesting uh, to play with uh, and to try and construct as well. It's, it's quite interesting little puzzle. Um, Here's a magic square. Uh, this is in uh, an engraving or etching, I can never remember which, by uh, Dura, uh, Melancholia. Um, and this, it, if, you, if you look in, the, I'll highlight it, in the top corner here is a little square, and enlarged, it looks like this. It's a, it's a magic square. There it is in plainer text so that you can see it better. Um, Every row, column, and diagonal in this thing adds to uh, the magic constant. That's what the magic square is. Um, so uh, it's not too much of a problem to uh, to work out what the magic constant is. In this case, it's 34. Uh, my question is, can you spot any other magic properties about this? Uh, anything anything else strike you about this 4x4 four four grid of numbers? I go in the chair and knew the artist. Does she, uh, does she know? Too many tricks about this, <laughs> but yeah, she's right. It has the um, it has the date in it down the bottom. is It says fifteen fourteen. Uh, that was the date the engraving was made. Okay, I'm going to run through a few of these. So every row, column, and diagonal sums to thirty four. Also, the four corners sum to thirty four. Also, four center squares, also sum to 34. Now the four squares like this, those two and those two, which is sum to 34. I'm trying to leave these up so they appear on your screen, okay. And also the vertical equivalents, those two and those two. They sum to 34. Now then, the, the, um, it says in my notes, symmetrically placed squares. That's this one, this one, this one, and this one. Those sum to 34. And as do the other four. This four like that, they, they also sum to 34. Okay, other odd properties. Well, the sum of the first two rows equals the sum of the last two rows. Now, that's obvious because every row sums to 34. Um, let me just draw those. So, those two yellow rows, if you, if you add those together, uh, they, they come to the same as the two, the two blue rows there. Now, this also works for the squares of those digits. Okay, so if you square each of those digits and then add up the sums of the squares, uh, the yellow rows will equal the blue rows. Now, that's the same for the columns. The yellow columns and the blue columns do the same thing. They both square the numbers and add them up, and they'll come to the same. The yellow ones will come to the same as the blue ones. And also, if you if you pair the first column, the first row with the third row, and then pair the second with the fourth, if you square and sum the digits on the first and third rows, they'll come to the same value as if you do that on the second and fourth rows. And columns, the same. If you put the first and third columns, and you put the second and fourth columns, square the digits, 
add them up, the yellow ones will equal the blue ones. As Ben says, there's a lot of magic in one square. <laughs> and then these, these odd symmetrically, uh, symmetrically spaced ones that I put in. Which are those. And those. Uh, this, this also works for the, the sums of the digits are the same, the yellows are the blues. Uh, the squares of the sum, sums of the squares of the digits and the sum of the cubes of the digits for those symmetrically placed squares all have those properties. Uh, and last but not least, the, the 15, 14 being in the center together gives you the date the, the, uh, the engraving was made. Now, Lloyd's asked a very pertinent question there. Did he deliberately put all of these properties in? Now, this is a debatable issue whether he deliberately put all those in. And also, if you, if you think about it for a little bit, um, quite a few of them are a consequence of the others. So once you've got a few of these in, you start to get more of them, if you see what I mean. Um, so it's debatable how much he would have known of those. <laughs> right. But anyway, so that's a very impressive uh, thing. And then what, what kind of impresses me a lot about this is that you, you've come up with this amazing magic square with all these magic properties, uh, and then you hide it away in the corner of your engraving like that. Uh, there's an awful lot of other things going on in this engraving. <laughs> Sharon says um, Jura was pretty clever and a bit of a geek. On the right is a is a statue of Dura, which is a photo that my dad took on holiday in Nuremberg a couple of years ago, and, and brought back for me. So that was good. <laughs> right, moving on. Latin squares are not unrelated uh, concepts to magic squares. Are Latin squares now? In a Latin square, every symbol occurs exactly once in each row and exactly once in each column. So I'll draw out a magic square. A uh, Latin square, sorry. So if you, I've drawn that wrong, <laughs> a quick test there, just check if you're awake. Um, if you look at this now, every row and column contains one, 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 two, and one, three, every row and column. Now they're fairly interesting. Uh, another. Another interesting concept is the uh, orthogonal Latin square or Greco-Latin squares. That's because um, they're often drawn out with uh, Latin letters and Greek letters. Now, what these are are essentially two overlaid Latin squares with the additional property that no two cells contain the same ordered pair of symbols. So if I draw this out, it'll be clearer what, what I mean. So what you're looking at here is a Latin square with the capital letters A, B, and C, and also with the uh, lowercase Greek letters alpha, beta, and gamma. But with the additional property that uh, the, if alpha, alpha appears, it only appears once, and so on. So that's quite a quite a neat concept. And again, it's it's kind of interesting trying to trying to build these at different sizes, trying to put them together. One thing that's quite good about Latin squares is it's quite easy to do them with playing cards. Uh, so if you think about it, if you uh, at our puzzle stall we had these giant playing cards on the floor, uh, and the instruction sheet next to them says, well, basically if you take three aces, three kings, and three queens, um, you can make a three by three ordinary Latin square from them, in which each row, column, diagonal contains one ace, one king, and one queen. Now, if you make sure they're taken from the same three suits. You can then use that to build a three by three orthogonal Latin square. If you add the jacks and a fourth suit, you can make a four by four orthogonal Latin square. And uh, if you want to be, um, if you're finding that all a little too easy, uh, you can make yourself a four by four orthogonal Latin square with the additional constraint that the diagonals contain only one value and one suit, uh, as well as the, uh, the rows and columns. <laughs> okay. Uh, Ben's pointed this out. This is sort of like Sudoku, Ben. Uh, a Sudoku, a, a completed Sudoku is a Latin square. Uh, in fact, Sudokus are a special case of, Latin, of 9 by 9 Latin squares uh, because they are a valid Latin square, but they have the additional property 
uh, that nine particular three by three subsquares must also contain the digits one to nine. So if you like, Sudoku is, is strong F condition than, than just the Latin square is. And there are also various other versions of these. Uh, Sudoku is an example of a modern puzzle phrase. Uh, and next I'm going to talk briefly about a um, less modern puzzle phrase that took place. So, oh, I'll tell you what I didn't say about uh, about Latin squares when I was there. About orthogonal well, Latin squares uh, was studied by Euler, uh, although they certainly predate him. Euler posed the problem of arranging 36 officers, six regiments of six officers, each of a different rank, and to line them up in a six by six grid so that each row and each column holds one officer of each rank and one officer from each regiment. So you can see that's like our playing cards uh, with suits and uh, values. Now this is impossible for Euler's 6x6 six six problem. Um, although this was studied by Euler and predates him, this was proved in 1901 uh, that, it, that it is impossible for 6x6. Six six. It's also impossible for 2x2. Two two. You can show that fairly easily by exhaustion, I think. Uh, but it is possible for all other sizes, and that fact was proved in 1960. So this is one of these nice pieces of mathematics that has a very simple statement, but actually is quite difficult to um, prove, and was actually proven as a fairly modern piece of mathematics. Um, yes, and I put a note here that orthogonal Latin squares are used in the design of experiments and tournament scheduling, because if you need things not to coincide, um, these are quite a good way of, of doing that. Right, I'll move on then. So the 15th puzzle. Uh, I'm going to write out what the solution needs to be of this. You'll probably be familiar with these when I explain what they are. 15. These are like these are a sliding puzzle. So each of these squares can be slid into the into the empty space and then moved around accordingly. And you're probably familiar with them um, with having a picture on where the picture is scrambled and you've got to get the picture into the right order. Uh, these were invented by somebody called Chapman, who was a postmaster from a village in New York State, certainly by 1874, possibly earlier. Um, and these created a craze in Europe and, and America and Europe in 19, oh dear, in 1880. Um, now, a chap called Sam Lloyd, who was a famous puzzle writer, uh, later claimed to have invented the puzzle, although this doesn't seem to be true, uh, and uh, he offered a prize for a solution of a particular variant of this puzzle. So if I delete those and put in 15 and 14 in, that, in the wrong order. So the game now is to slide these pieces around until you get them back into the correct order, the numerical order. Now, Sam Lloyd offered $1,000 for a solution to the 1415 puzzle. Right. I'm going to try and get a bit of interaction going from you. Um, I am going to fill in a square now, arbitrarily, and we're going to find out uh, whether it can be solved or not. I'll show you how to, how to determine whether it can be solved or not. So there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There are eight of you, and I need 15 digits. Now, what I need is numbers 1 to 15 in random order, let's say, uh, but with no repeats. So I think the best thing to do, Sharon started us out, uh -huh, 8, 6, right, let me write this in, 6, 5, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, to, I hope somebody's checking these are unique, but they look unique to me so far. Uh, oh, I've gone wrong. So 9, 12, 13, 14, what's missing? 15, 4, there we are. Very good, thank you. So now we have our arbitrary square. Now the way we work out um, whether it can be solved or not is that you look from from the top left hand corner. You need to go uh, examine each of these squares. So Hi, I lost you for a second. Okay, 
assuming it disconnected for a second and then reconnected. So I'm just going to let you speak for a second in case there's anything wrong. Hello, everyone. Um, yes, Peter, you just went out for a, a brief moment on my screen. Um, we didn't seem to be hanging for very long, so um, I think if you're back up and running, um, everything should be fine. That's good. And I've reshared my. Um, I've reshared my screen, uh, and people are saying they can see it again. So that's good. Um, <laughs> in a magic trick, that would be the bit where I've swapped it out for one that I know how to solve. But anyway, um, right. So if we start with the top left-hand corner, what we're doing is we're we're moving from left to right, one row at a time. And we're looking how many squares remain that are lower than the current one. So at the moment, I'm looking at this top left one. It is 8. And I know there are 7 with a value lower than 8. So I'm going to write down 7. Now, if I look at the next square, this one has 6 in it. Well, there are 5 that remain that are lower than 6. So I'm going to write down 5. The next square is 5, or well, there are 4 remaining. The next square is where it starts to get a little bit interesting. The next square is 10. Now, there are 9 squares that are of a lower value than 10, but 8, 6, and 5 have already gone, which leaves 6 more. So the next square has 3 in it, or well, there are 2 lower than 3. The next has 11 in it. Well, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 have already gone. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. So that leaves 6. I want to say. That leaves 5. 5, because there are 10 lower than 11. Sorry, I was counting it wrong. So there are 5, which is 1, 2, 9, and 4, still remaining to be counted, that are lower than 11. The next digit is 1. Now, there are no, never any that are lower than 1. The next is 7. Well, 1, 3, 5, and 6 have already gone. That only leaves 2 and 4, so I'll put 2. The next one is 2, or well, 1 has already gone, so there are none remaining that are lower than 2. The next is 9. Only 4 remains that is lower than 9, so I'll put 1. Uh, count one of those. 12, again, only 4 remains. Uh, sorry, yeah, only 4 remains, so that's another 1. 13 is the same, only 1. 14 only has 1, 15 only has 1, and then 4 has none. Okay, so I hope that's clear. Then, what we have to do is we have to um, add these numbers up, uh, which if anyone's good at mental arithmetic, they might do quicker than I can. Uh, but I'm going to give it a go. And. Um, Stephen says 36, is that right? Good, and then we add a digit for um, the row number of the blank space. Um, so, so you've told me the sum of these is uh, 36. We add 4 because the blank space is on row 4 and that gives us 40. Now, what we're looking for is, if this number is odd, there is no solution. If it's even, then there is a solution. So in this case, it's even, so this square can be solved. But if, if, if you think about, <laughs> prove it, says Alan. Um, to give an indication, if you think about, um, each number has to be swapped with all those that are lower than it which is why you're looking for numbers that are lower than the current one, then, um, then I'll answer your question in a moment. You've got to swap it with all the digits that are lower than it. So you're looking for the number of uh, changes that have to be made. And if the number of changes that have to be made is even, uh, then it can be done. And if the number of changes that have need to be made are odd, then it can't be done, because you can't slide in the way that it swaps and swap an odd number over them. Uh, then your question was, if you move 13 down, then it's it, it's odd. If you move 13 down, you change the order of all the numbers, so they or change the order of one of the numbers, 
Uh, so in that case, your values will come out differently, and you've changed the number on which the blank square appears. So uh, all these numbers change. Uh, and Alan, I'm not going to give a full proof, <laughs> if you don't mind. Right, let's look at Sam Lloyd's um, puzzle. Stephen has a question I don't know the answer to. Does that work for any square? It works for a 4 by 4 um, I don't know, is the answer. Because if you have different size squares, would it matter how many... Sorry, I meant a middle square. Oh, I think, do you mean if the blank is on the middle square? Yes. Yes, I think so. I might have to check that. But I think you just write down the row number of the blank. I don't think you need to write down the... Uh, I don't think the column number matters. Though I can't quite visualize why that would be. Anyway, um, in terms of different size squares, I suspect if it was a 5 by 5 square, it would be a different how many whether you could swap them in the first place. Anyway, uh, let's look at the Samloid's 1415 puzzle. This is the one with the big prize um, money attached to it. So in this case, the first square has one in it. Well, there are none lower than that. And the next one has two. Well, there are none lower than that. And the next one has three. And the next one has four, five, six, seven, eight. Because they're in numerical order, there are, there are none lower than each of them at every point. Then you get to 15. Well, 15 has one lower than it, and 14 has none lower than it. And then we add 4 because the blank is on row 4, and we get 5. So because 5 is odd, we know that this puzzle can't be solved, and therefore Sam Lloyd's $1,000 was perfectly safe. There is a puzzle you can do with the 14-15 layout, though, uh, with 14 or 15 swapped around. Uh, you can use this layout and the sliding rules uh, to make a magic square with magic constant 30. Uh, so again, that's a little takeaway puzzle for you if you fancy playing around with this. Uh, the way I did it at the fair was that I, I got these tokens and I wrote numbers on them, and then we drew a grid, and you just had to move the tokens around the grid. So although, you know, traditionally it's a sliding puzzle and you're forced to slide them in certain ways, then um, that doesn't really matter as long as you obey the rules. The problem with being able to pick them up and move them around is it's very tempting to do so. <laughs> I suppose so. Right. Now then, I put in logic puzzles if there's time. Uh, I think perhaps I'll I'll skip over those because they'll they'll take uh, ten minutes or so. Um, so I'll, I'll declare that at the end because we're coming up to the uh, we're coming up to the hour. So uh, thank you very much for listening. Um, I've put here links, I think these are all the links that I've mentioned in the show. I've also added a link, if you look at my YouTube, you can see I made some videos of different puzzles and things, uh, sort of more physical puzzles. Um, and if you want to get in touch with me, uh, my website's at the bottom. The other thing to say at this point is, uh, I feel at the start this is a bit of an experiment. Um, we're interested in whether this sort of format of talk works, uh, and I guess it's it's sort of designed to be good for people who don't have local branch talks that they can go along to, uh, that they can still sort of engage with an RMA talk. But anyway, so Stephen's going to put a link in the chat window. Uh, there it is. So, <laughs> so you can uh, you can go to this link. It's just a very short little survey. Um, you can sort of give us plenty of feedback if you want to, but uh, just just if you don't mind going and filling that in, that would be very helpful. Uh, because it'll let us know whether or not this sort of thing is worth trying to do again in the future. Um, and I think there's an opportunity for you to volunteer to give a talk yourself if you'd like to. So, um, right, thank you very much then. Uh, I'm going to release the microphone in case Stephen's got anything to say. Yeah, not, nothing to add other than just to um, say thanks to Peter for obviously um, putting together this talk and um, giving it to date. So um, we're hopeful that we'll have a, a recording of this as well so that um, we can let people um, check over it again and get the links or have a go at the puzzles. And also, if you do want to pass this link around to the recording to your friends, um, then they can obviously have a review of it as well. But um, yep, if you do have a chance to put any feedback into that short form, then, then please do so. But uh, thanks for coming along anyway. Thank you, everyone. Good night.